Welcome to Enlightened Conversations podcast, brought to you by YWCA Hanover. I'm your host, Lisa Smith, and I am so pleased that you have chosen to listen and learn with us as we explore a wide range of topics related to the YWCA's mission to eliminate racism, empower women, and bring peace, justice, freedom, and dignity to all people. Today's guest is Lisa Bollinger, Certified Nurse Practitioner with Wellspan Family Medicine. Lisa has specialized training in assisting clients who are undergoing gender transformation. Making the decision to undergo medical procedures to change one's gender is not an easy decision to make, nor is it something that happens quickly. When that individual is an adult, this can be a difficult decision. But when that individual is a teen or a preteen, it becomes even more complicated. Those teen years are fraught with all sorts of hormonal changes and growth issues that can complicate life in the best of circumstances. That's where someone like Lisa Bollinger, with her medical expertise and her kind, capable assistance, comes into play. We recently talked about some of the issues that arise with that decision and the management of that medical care, a conversation that I found very enlightening. Hopefully you will too. Lisa, can you give me, if there is such a thing, a typical scenario of how a teen or a preteen might end up in your office to ask about gender change procedures or to tell you that I don't think I was supposed to be born into this body. So there's a variable amount of ways that that can occur. Interesting enough, um, some providers do not um, go right there in a regular physical exam for well child checks. Um, But what we found to be most effective, and you have to, again, know your audience, if you're a family provider and you know your patient and you know the the family that surrounds that patient, some of those questions can be asked, but there's other situations where we have to ask for that parent to actually be removed from the room. So we can have a one-on-one conversation with the teenager or the adolescent, both about gender and sexuality, which are two different things. Um, The other important way that we can get some clients that come in to discuss that is we do have a network here at Wellspan and we have a centralized um, licensed social worker who will actually direct care to certain providers who she knows uh, provides that care. So there may be some people who are seeking care elsewhere and didn't even know that that was an available option for them. So we can receive referrals from uh, places that are outside of our uh, medical organization and also within. Uh, The difficulty though, I think, is that you just need to start the conversation, you know, and mm-hmm. that's something that even some of our colleagues struggle with. So the first thing is to to have the willingness to open it up. Um, but generally, that's that's how we get most of our clients. Does the conversation start with "I'm not happy"? Is that the comment, or uh, is it, does it start with "I think I should have been a girl"? Um, or- Both of those things can happen. Um, Sometimes there's some ambiguity about, uh, you know, we ask if they're sexually active and then we might ask the next question uh, and we just go there. We say, are your partners male or female? Or if you don't have a partner, which would you prefer? So that gets to the sexuality part and they do overlap, but they're also separate. So that's that's the difficult part. Um, Sometimes just talking about sex in general can open up the discussion about gender as well. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of people who will start, um, say it's a female born client who says, I don't like that I have breasts. We even get that. And so that, yeah, that's an opener to a full discussion about what does that mean to them um, in the full capacity and what are they thinking? What are their questions about that? You know, so it's there, there's a big variety of how we get there. I think key number one and foremost is just to be open enough to have that conversation. And, you know, a lot of us that are doing family practice, some of these kids we've had since they were born, you know, I have kids, you know, birth to their college years and a lot happens within that time. And 
you know, I don't want to say that we're their surrogate parent, but they've come to trust, know, and understand that there's really nothing that they can bring to us that we would not um, embrace and try to help them through. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's and nothing big... that would shock you. No, right. no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What What's the general age when you think a child might decide that that they're uncomfortable in their body or come to the realization that they're uncomfortable in their body and that that discomfort may have something to do with their gender you know yeah yeah so the research will tell you a whole bunch of different stuff what i've seen personally i've seen that as early as five or six um mm -hmm. but most of that conversation uh, either with family members, a friend, or their medical provider comes out between the ages of 13 and 15, I would say. Um, sometimes older, and the older is just because they're afraid to say it. You know, it's not that yeah. they haven't felt it before, they're just afraid to say it. And that, yeah. that's, that's the tough part. And in my opinion, we live in a kind of um, community where that's not always well accepted or well received. So that may be the delay as well. It depends on what their support system is, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> are, are parents required to be involved? I noticed you said about asking the parents to leave the room. At what age can you have a conversation with the child without the parent in the room? So we can't necessarily mandate that. Um, we ask that of the parent because my, you know, my impression or how I, how I present that is that I think the child might feel more comfortable in talking to me if you weren't there. Um, what we generally do is once we see the patient, we identify that there's a need to, to take that a little bit further. We oftentimes have the conversation with the patient and say, listen, I know that you're having a difficult time telling your parents this, do you want us to help you to do that? So sometimes we'll bring the parent back in and facilitate that conversation. There's also some increasing difficulty in the fact that one parent embraces it and the other one does not. Oh yeah, I could yeah, see so, that being a problem. Yeah, yeah, so if we have two parent family households, you know, um, that can become a very difficult thing. Um, they really need to have there's some signatures that we require here. So they would really need to have the family support to pursue with any uh, hormone, you know, treatment, of course, even hormone treatment can be definitive. It's not going to be something that they can go backwards on. So we want to make sure that they're clear with that. They understand that and they're ready for that. Um, there's no like, you know, test or meter or anything like that to determine that. that a lot of times that's the provider who's seeing them that can determine if that's something that they're ready for. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Does insurance cover? They do. They do. Okay. All now, right. There's certain things that we have to do to make that happen. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's thought and there's controversy around this, you know, it's really not an endocrine disorder, in my opinion, um, but that's kind of what they call it. Um, okay. It's a combination of just a designated health issue is more what I would say. I don't think it's a disorder. Does Disorder implies that you're broken, right? And I don't, I don't right. think broken. I think they're just, they're just making choices. You know what I mean? They're making choices based on experience, based on feelings, based on complex emotions that that sometimes we just have to dignify with saying that you're not broken. It's okay. You know, we can help you with this. And We're going to make it better, yeah, but it yeah. wasn't broken. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than looking at, I hate the word disorder. I really I just don't think that that's, <laughs> I don't think that's right. You know, because yeah. they're broken. It's just that um, they have this, um, that needs to, they need to talk through it and they need to make sure that the choices they're making um, are right for them. You mm -hmm. know? So yes, insurance does cover most of the hormone therapy and we've gotten to an era where they are starting to cover top and bottom surgery as well. So um, a lot of the more, a lot of the medical community now is um, getting on board with what we're trying to do, you know, yeah. um, and not thinking of it as such a far fetched outside of the norm treatment. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now with the, 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 um, the hormone therapy, okay, mm -hmm. the medical intervention, is that something that if you start it early enough, mm -hmm. let, let's say you've got a young girl, someone mm -hmm. who is born female, mm -hmm. and um, is definitely certain that 
that that was not their path in life. If you start that therapy early enough, would breasts not develop? So the top surgery may not be necessary. Um, so that would, that would be variable as well. So it kind of depends on where they are with their staging. We call it Tanner stages of development. Um, you know, Tanner stage two is around five or six. It would be even that low. I personally do not treat children that young um, just because I don't do hormone blocking. However, we do have um, local entities that do that. Now, what would happen in a teenager who say was born a female has already went through puberty but let's say they started this hormone treatment at 13 to maybe 16, 17, 18. The um, breast tissue redistributes itself is what I'm going to tell you. So, yes, okay. um, I have some clients that have um, started their transition as late as 18, 19, and their breast development tissue has changed just on testosterone to make it so they didn't feel they needed to have the top surgery. Um, but again, that's variable. A lot of times it's, um, it's how they feel in their own body. You know, some people really desire to take that next step. Some people don't need to. So mm -hmm. it, it really, we have a whole host of variation with that. And I have a whole number of people that have different viewpoints on that, but in general, hormone therapy will absolutely change the distribution of breast tissue. And in some cases make it so they don't even need that surgery. Right. So it depends on the person and, and the time and, and, yeah, and the timing and, and all of that. When someone starts on hormone therapy for um, gender realignment, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, do they stay on that for life? They, they generally do um, because, uh, for example, if we have a genetically born female who then starts testosterone, um, the testosterone is utilized to stop menstruation, right? So if you can imagine if we withdraw that testosterone and then a transgender male then has a period or a menstruation, oh. it's very, very, very dysmorphic to them, you know? Oh, yeah. Almost yeah, it can almost be traumatizing. So um, for the most part, and again, not 100%, you know, because then you have to talk about later adults going through menopause, and that complicates things as well. So there's a whole variation of that. But for the most part, yes, it would be an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are so complex. They are. That's it's why just... I think it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> You find it cool. Yeah. Somebody like me who who is not really into biology side of science finds it a little off-putting, you know, sure. um, but so that's why I'm glad that you do that, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I just can't imagine all of the various complications that can come up with, with anything like that, you know. You know, and, and that's why I have never understood the attitude against people who need to go through this um, gender change. And I, and I really feel that it's a need. I don't think anybody willingly says, I want to take medicine for the rest of my life, and I want to subject myself to potential ridicule and all kinds of surgery because... I just feel like it. It's a lark. No one would do that. You yep. know, the, in my humble opinion, the degree of emotional and mental anguish that these individuals must go through to come to the decision that their only way to have a happy life is to go through these medical is things is, is just overwhelming. Right. Um, you know, it, so I, I never have understood the well, anger against them. And it comes know? from a fundamental need that we all share, right? Is it's just that we just want to be accepted as we are. Exactly. Yeah. It's just and, very, and particularly yeah. uh, ourselves accepting us as we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, that, that makes a, a big, big difference. What happens if you run into an issue with, um, a teen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And parents are very, very opposed. Uh, at what point uh, is there an age where parents 
need not be involved, where the child is now old enough to proceed on their own without parental sign off or whatever? It, that could be complicated, to be honest with you. So in the state of Pennsylvania, um, a client can come see me without their parent consent or their parent awareness for things, matters that are, in, are included in mental health or sexual reproduction. So technically, and this would be something that might be a little tough, you know what I mean? Technically, those issues could overlap and could align with gender dysphoria. So technically, I guess we could see them. My, my only reservation with initiating treatment without a parent consent is that, that that child or teenager is going to need some support as that happens. Do you know what I mean? Right. So Absolutely. personally, I try to involve um, all, all parties. We have variable responses to that. If there is somebody who's adamantly against it, Typically what I do is I'll say, can you bring your mom or dad in here so that I can explain to them what this really means, you know? And sometimes it's a lack of understanding that mm -hmm. they've never truly heard their child speak in a way that I have heard their child speak. You know what I mean? Right. So, so they need that and they need a facilitator. We do access a number of different mental health organizations that help with that. Um, so sometimes we encourage family-based therapy so that they can first understand what that's going to look like to their family unit before we pursue that, you know, that process, because it really does affect everybody. Yeah. Um, a yeah. lot of parents describe, um, a feeling of losing a child and gaining a new one. Mm, that's what their experience is. I'm not really sure that that's what's happening, but that's how they feel, you know, yeah. so, it really is super important to include everybody because if you don't, that child's going to struggle as she, as she or he moves through their transition. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that psychological support kind of a regular part of the treatment uh, or is it only when you note that there's an issue? Most of the time it is part of it. Um, it's not a deal breaker though. You know, years ago when we first started doing this, there was a kind of an assumed expectation that they had to have so many visits with a mental health professional to say that they know that this um, hormone treatment or whatever they're going to pursue is going to be permanent. We don't require that so much anymore because a lot of times that can really, really delay their treatment and really allow for the progression of their mental health stability to decline. Um, right. so we're trying to address their mental health issues and address you know, the physical change that are needed because they overlap. Because if you're living in a body that you don't feel is yours, you know, and that's the fundamental source of your depression, your anxiety, and all of that, you know, really we're doing more than just helping that client. We may be potentially preventing a suicide. You exactly. Know? Yeah. It really becomes a bigger issue. And it it's something that, um, you know, are we always trained to know exactly when and how that should be navigated? I would probably have to say no. I think a better way to look at it is, is again, you just have to know your person that you're dealing with. It helps to know them because you know where they are in their thought process, where they are with the family. And that's where family medicine, in my opinion, I used to think it was a curse, but I actually think it's a benefit because we typically do treat multiple members of that family. And we typically are familiar with multiple members of the family and we know what environment that child is living in, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. so we can better determine how do we navigate through that? How do we you're getting through that? Yeah. You're getting a better idea of the whole yeah. picture. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, is there a risk Lisa to, um, the, the individuals who are undergoing these procedures, I mean, uh, the taking these medications, that sort of thing. I mean, they say that there's a risk in taking an aspirin. So, you know, other than that is, is there any long-term risk in having, uh, you know, being on these hormones for a long time and that sort of thing? Yes. Uh, I'm okay. To be completely transparent, um, uh, in some clients, high levels of testosterone that, um, you know, exceed what the normal threshold is, can cause rage, anger, 
um, really cardiac dysfunction too. So we could, we have to watch their heart. There's a lot of implications of what we do with the hormones that we need to really be careful of. And that's why it requires close monitoring in a, a transitional female, you know, we're giving high doses of estrogen. We also can potentially increase their risk for breast cancer, even right. though they were genetically born a male, then we have to be aware that, okay, now we're giving you all this estrogen. So we have to do mammograms on you you know, mm -hmm. and that's whether or not they had top surgery. It doesn't matter. We still have to right. do, we have to do manual, you know, exams looking for lumps or bumps, and we have to do the screenings that come with that. So yeah. another area where it can be really complicated and hormones can mess with the other metabolic um, uh, balance of the body too. So there is a, a need to have constant follow-up blood testing, you know, screenings well into their adult years and beyond, because that's, what's going to be important to maintain their overall health, not just, not just their transition. You know, we have to look at the whole picture and not just that one issue. Right. Because you want to, you want the end result to be a healthy person. Yes. Regardless of gender. Yeah. Yes. And then, aspects. Yeah. Yes. And then we have to have, you know, conversations about, well, who are you having sex with? Are you having mm -hmm. Not to be graphic, but are you having, you know, vaginal sex? Are you having anally receptive sex? What are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, once we know that, um, then we have to do the appropriate screens that go with that. Yeah. You know? So it, it is a conversation that some people have difficulty having, but it's really necessary. And that would be even in a person that wasn't transgender. You know what I mean? Right. We still have to talk about those things. And it's important to that they understand what, what goes with that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that those are critical um, discussion points, regardless. Yes. So, um, and I could see with a t with a teenager, mm -hmm. um, in particular, that those could be difficult subjects to yeah, tackle. Yeah, and, and a lot the, of times know. with the initiation of hormones, and they've already been through their um, genetically born puberty. You know, I'm going to really induce. I always tell them, you're, you're going to go through puberty again. It's yeah. going to feel like you're going through it again. Your voice is going to crack. You know, you're going to feel unbalanced. You're going to feel like you're mad. Those are things that your family has to be ready and aware of. Like, you're you not know, I can almost see the eye roll and hear the sigh that goes, yes. you know, yeah. oh, again, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. exactly. when, when teens are trying to process this decision, does to does peer influence enter the equation or is it usually not something that's even mentioned to one's peers until a decision is made and the process is started and then you might open up to. I, I would say peers. 10 years ago, that looked a lot different. Um, mm -hmm. But now there is a large amount of peer influence because of social media, you know, okay. Um, somebody can go online, find a chat room and find another person who may be feeling those same things. And so most of their information, unfortunately, and I say, unfortunately, and fortunately may come from a 15 year old that lives in California, you know, mm -hmm. who may be feeling the same way, um, here locally in the Hanover area, we do have a number of, I'm just going to tell you, it's a community and a number of folks between 14 and 17 who talk to each other. They usually know each other. Um, and a lot of times I find I'll see one patient and I'll be talking to them and they'll say, oh, you treat my friend, whoever. So they are networked here together, not 100 percent. You know, there are some individuals that come forward on their own and never had any conversation with, you know, their peers. Um, but there's a high number of people that have already conversed about how they feel and what they're thinking with a peer, either virtually or at their same school. Mm hmm. So yeah. there's some support there from, from like-minded peers. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is, which I would think would be very important. Yeah. You know, to, I think it's important for opening the discussion, but it, it can be a little dangerous when they start asking questions because they may not have all the knowledge they need to answer the questions back and forth. Well, and each person's situation is going to be different because each person's body is different. But at least there's the the support. I keep I, I'm hearing the the song I get by with a little help from my friends playing in the back of my head here. You know that they're going to need support. You know, hundred percent. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, what are the biggest issues that you see with this particular population? Um, sometimes one of the biggest issues is the overlap of, of the mental health part, you know, um, making sure that, you know, they really have a struggle in finding access to therapists here locally. Um, as you probably know, there's a, there's a long waiting list for them to get into therapy to just mm -hmm. simply talk about the things. And then unfortunately, a lot of times that responsibility or however you want to say it does fall to me which may not be difficult to accomplish in a, in a 15 or 20 or even a 30 minute appointment when I have, you know, five out in the waiting room that need to be seen as well. So that can become a difficult thing because I feel like it's part of it. They need it. They need that constant feedback to ask questions, to know what to expect, to kind of guide them through the transition, to talk about, you know, things like, okay, now you have a little tiny bit of facial hair. So which bathroom are you going to use when you go to the mall? Right. You know, those things come up. And right. Exactly. That, yeah. And that has to be answered, you know, um, for example, homecoming's coming, you know, so do I wear a tux or do you think I should wear a dress, Lisa? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I questions like that. Yeah. So yeah. those kind of things I think I struggle with. And then the other part of that is, I won't say 100% of the time, but probably as high as 50 to 70, usually we find out that there's an underlying trauma, mm -hmm. um, usually a sexual trauma of some kind, and that um, needs then to be dealt with, right? I mean, right. And so we want to get them to the appropriate help, and um, it's just there's not enough mental health help out there. They're just yeah. For any right. of us, really, for any of us. So right, yeah. No matter what the issue, the the you know that that part of our healthcare system is so sorely lacking. Right. You know, there just aren't enough people that go no. that go in that. So, um, you know, what what are your biggest concerns for um these these folks, no matter what the age? Um, probably you know isolation, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that could be really within the family unit. We really don't see so much of that in, in schools, even it's really not something that we hear a whole lot about because there's a number of students at most of the schools here surrounding us, you know, New Oxford, Southwest, Hanover that have a close knit community, but when they go home and they want to be called their male gender name and they're called their female name or people discount or disregard that that's, you know, their decision, what happens to that patient then or that person then, you know, yeah. my concern is like, how is that going to be received? What is their support system going to be? What if they don't have support? How right. do we provide that? You know, and um down the down the road like how do they transition into the world mm -hmm. without support we do have a number of people here locally that i can tell you that are adults that work openly in some of our regional areas here home depot lowe's uh kohl's i have a number of people that are out there that are fully transgender and respected for their for their new gender so that is encouraging to me that the community is getting to be a little bit better but then, you know, there's the opposite side of that where we're receiving threats because we do this kind of care or, you know, people are um, saying that they won't come here anymore because we provide this kind of care. Oh, good heavens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's yeah. plenty of that. And the pride events um, here locally, like in Hanover, you know, we do that every year. Wellspan participates in that. And I'm usually over there every single year. It's generally a positive thing, but not 100 percent of the time, you know, right. There's mm -hmm. situations that are not always positive, and I just hate the idea that there could be any kind of act of violence or anything that would be like that mm -hmm. for these folks that are just trying to live their lives as they authentically are, you know? Right, right. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think whether the issue is gender identification mm -hmm. or sexuality, it's, it's, it's basically people just want to be, right. be who not, they are, you know? pushing that on anybody else you know no. it's not like so I just it, that's my rule in life anyway if you're not hurting me you're not hurting my children you do you you know yeah I mean? exactly you know so 
Are there other people now? I know you went for specialized training mm -hmm. to be able to provide this particular, um, to, uh, this particular care on top of your nurse practitioner training. Mm -hmm. um, are there other people in the in our general area that have that specialized training? There, there are. So okay. Western in particular does have a whole list of providers that are providing this type of care. We have a physician here at our Baltimore Street location who also does this. Um, now, medical practice, uh, so Wellspan has a residency program at York Hospital that, that are now making it part of their training to be trained in this, which is fantastic. Yes, because even if they're not going to practice that, at least when they recognize it, they will understand it, be respectful of it and know what to do. You know, and then I mean? they can refer to someone Absolutely. who specializes. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have over the last three years, I think I really feel proud of the fact um, that they've developed a whole organization. Like we have a, a list of OBGYNs who will do bottom surgery. We have a breast surgeon in Chambersburg who will do top surgery. You know, we have a number of providers here that will do um, hormone therapy, but a lot of it truthfully is the provider comfortability. If they're not comfortable doing that, which I understand, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're not going to do it, you know? So there's, there's some degree of that we have to work on, um, I think bending the bias, if you'll, if you'll, understand what I'm saying with that, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. making people understand that there's a whole different way to provide medical and mental health care than just the traditional ways. We have to kind of look outside of our box and that's what we do as medical providers. Anyway, there's new ways to treat diabetes, right? So right. there's new ways to do this and there's new ways to do that. And I think, uh, making the education available to everybody is probably key. You know, mm -hmm. I chose it because I had a patient that presented in a certain way that I, I didn't understand and I didn't know how to do any of that. So traditionally, we didn't get that training. So I did not know how to treat this particular individual, which sparked my interest in, you know, the whole subject in general. And then I went to Fenway Center and, you know, things just kind of rolled with that. But I think it needs to be a fundamental part of our uh, medical training. And historically, it has not been so. Right. But it, it sounds like that's changing. It is changing. It's, I, I, yeah, that's yeah, that and that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, um, any um, last words? Any recommendations for books, websites, anything like that, where people can turn to get more information? Because I always like to leave folks with, um, if you want to know more, here's where you go. So. There, so there's a couple different options. Um, so the state of Pennsylvania does have a annual conference called the Keystone Conference. Okay. That's in Harrisburg. So they just look up Keystone Conference. Um, that is a conference for transgender LGBT folks um, and medical providers and healthcare people that are involved in the management of that clientele. A lot of times they have attendees who are transgender or LGBT and that uh, you can select what classes might be interested in, you know, to you. That's one resource that we use pretty routinely. Um, locally here though, if somebody was interested in seeking care or finding out about that, or, you know, wanted a resource really as far as Shippensburg to, you know, way on the other side of York, we do have on our website, Wellspan's website, different resources that we can help them with. The third, Third thing that I would just suggest is that in Philadelphia, um, it's called the Masoni, M-A-S-O-N-I clinic. Masoni clinic is um, state renowned at doing this type of care and they actually can help to be a resource for the younger clientele, you know, that age of four to maybe 12, 13, 14, and they can assist with that as well. Um, so those are the resources that we consider to be most respectful and you know, the authority is on what we're, we're trying to accomplish. That's great. That's great. Good information to know. So, uh, thank you so much, Lisa. You've really kind of broadened our understanding here. And I hope maybe for a lot of folks in the area, understanding more and knowing more will help them to accept more. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. 
Stop by again when you have a chance to listen and learn with another enlightened conversation. Just check the YWCA Hanover website and social media for new release dates and topics. If you have topics you would like to learn about, please email me, Lisa Smith, at lsmith at ywcahanover.org. And as always, keep learning. Keep learning.